Hello, uh, my name's Mike Batty. Tom invited me to uh, talk to the meeting, the OECD uh, International Transport Forum meeting. I can't make it, uh, unfortunately, because I'm away, I'm abroad, I'm in Australia. Uh, so I thought I'd make a short video about what I might have said, and Tom, in fact, uh, uh, has a paper that uh, he may or may not have circulated, but there is some information about what I'm going to say in paper form. I'm going to talk about data and cities. I'm going to talk about big data, which of course is all the rage at the moment uh, in some senses. Uh, but I'm also going to make the point that big data has always in a way been there. Um, it can also be small in some senses if we rephrase things, and we can also uh, turn small data into big data. So I'm going to sort of, uh, you know, throw a few ideas around about this. Now, I'm going to select from this PowerPoint that I've given before. I'm going to talk really about big and small. Um, I want to begin with some examples in Ireland uh, in, uh, in the mid-19th century, uh, and then say something about ideas about time and space and topics that really define data in cities. And then really I want to concentrate the, the rest of the talk um, about 10-15 minutes on locations and interactions, flow systems in cities, which is obviously central to the idea of uh, transportation. So understanding and visualizing flows is what this is all about. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of the problems of, of large data, big data, on the web and on the desktop, uh, and in particular just uh, uh, finish really by talking about new types of big data, stream data, data in real time, uh, and just mention our Oyster Card project here in London. Okay, so uh, let me begin and, uh, and really say that uh, in a way, um, big data has always been with us. If we think about uh, locations in cities, if we have n locations, for example, then we immediately have n squared interactions. So if you have uh, traffic uh, assignment zones, basically, TASs, etc., in a city, and there are 50 of them, then there are potentially 2,500 trips between them, 50 squared. So in some senses, uh, even locational data, which might have been comparatively small uh, prior to the big data revolution, uh, can still generate uh, large quantities when we begin to look at interaction effects. Um, uh, here, for example, is uh, some of the problems of data. The problems of visualizing interaction effects have always been important in this sense. The data has always been big. Uh, here, for example, is um, uh, is a map of uh, flows in Dublin in 1837, done by the British Army, basically, uh, who were looking at uh, a proposal to uh, put some uh, railway lines into, uh, into Ireland uh, in the vicinity of Dublin. You can see how they've counted the flows. And then a little bit later, um, in the late 19th century, Ravenstein, uh, who looked at migration, basically, uh, basically began to plot flows in this sense. And these two diagrams, I think, uh, uh, illustrate the, the, the notion that uh, locational data, when thought of in terms of uh, interaction data or flow data, can become quite substantial, quite big, very difficult to visualize in this particular context. Um, an excellent example of big data, if you're able to look at this, then this is really good. It's a YouTube uh, video of big data in 1955. It talks about uh, uh, the problem that uh, the, Lions computer, the Lions electronic office, the, the, the Lions computer uh, uh, computing um, uh, installation, which is used for the Lions tea shops. It talks about how uh, they rented their computers out to British Railways at that point, and British Railways wanted to price freight uh, on their lines, and they had a big interaction or flow problem in that sense. And it really talks about the kind of issues involved in uh, what was then big data and extremely small uh, computers, etc. So have a look at that at some point at your leisure. Um, right at the beginning, really, of thinking about data and cities, then people began to try and classify it. And the, the geographer Brian Berry in 1964 suggested uh, there is something called the, the, uh, the data cube. It's, it's now been called the data cube. It's really a three-dimensional uh, picture of how data explodes. We have, in this particular context, in two dimensions, the attributes of the data uh, and location. So those would be places and uh, attributes of the location, such as the number of people, uh, the number of employees, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, this changes over time, and that produces our data cube. And it's really time, to some extent, uh, that has really generated big data uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, prior to uh, our embedding of computers into the built environment, 
uh, then um, we really didn't have real real-time stream data but now we're getting real-time stream data and the data is second by second and, and, and clearly there's a massive data explosion uh, when is when one is producing data of this form okay let me move on to flow systems in cities and show you a little bit about um, uh, about some of the problems of visualization here are some pictures that uh, I drew uh, about 40 years ago um, in my book urban modeling uh, which show the flow systems, the journey to work. This is in um, central and northeast Lancashire, these pictures. And then at the bottom of the screen, you can actually see um, uh, flow data pertaining to local authorities in London. And one of the, the clear issues in this particular context is that if you, if you have any number of zones which are, are uh, significant, any more than about 10 or 20 zones, etc., then to, to plot the matrix of flows between them is really quite problematic in that sense. There's a massive vision visualization problem in plotting flows. Here are some examples uh, where we've gone from 33 local authorities to, um, uh, to wards in London. This is Greater London and as you can see the two diagrams at the bottom uh, in the middle of the screen on the right really show pictures that are not very meaningful. Uh, even some of the fancy visualizations that are going on with big data at the moment uh, really fail to deal with the flow problem. Here for example on the top left um, is a circle visualization where the local authorities all 33 of them in London uh, are arrayed around the edge and these are the flows across. These are very characteristic and they're very good to show flows between a limited number of countries or a limited number of places but when you've got large numbers of places in this sense you really have massive data in that sense which is very hard to visualize. Um, here's a pattern of uh, uh, another issue about big data and flows in this context. These are uh, the interactions between the uh, 633 wards within uh, Greater London uh, and this gives you uh, a very large number of, uh, of points in this particular context and you can see that even statistics begins to break down here. Uh, if you look at the bottom left for example then we have so many points that we can color them uh, in terms of the scatter uh, where you have more points basically then they're colored somewhat differently these are gray tones of course but you can actually see how statistical theory itself begins to change uh, and this is, this is the realm really of big data and data mining that we're seeing at this point. But the data is relatively modest uh, in traditional terms, although it's big uh, when we explode it into flow terms, etc. It's not anything that uh, we needed to uh, have in the big, we, we needed to develop in, in, in terms of the big data era, uh, because this kind of data has been available for many years. Uh, the number of zones that we have in Greater London, 633, this is taken from the 2001 census, but we could do the same from the 1991 census. And anybody working in transportation flow data uh, knows how, uh, knows how uh, difficult it is to actually get to grips with, uh, with some of the patterns uh, and to mine the data in this sense. Okay, now um, we're building um, a model of, uh, of England and Wales, we'll extend it ultimately to Scotland, uh, where we're actually, have it, uh, where we're actually uh, scaling the, uh, the urban models up really to the entire country. Uh, and we're using what are called uh, middle area super output areas. These are smaller than wards, they tend to be of the order uh, of about uh, 5,000 persons each, perhaps a bit less, three to 5,000 persons living in these wards. Uh, there are 7,200, 7,201 to be precise, uh, in England and Wales, I should say, not the UK. Um, uh, and this, in fact, generates a potential number of interactions, something of the order of 52 million. So it's 7201 squared, uh, something uh, 52 million. So in the model we're building, we have to hold in, in memory, we have to hold uh, very big matrices with 52 million uh, uh, entries in, in memory for a variety of reasons, etc. And although our models run quite speedily in a matter of seconds uh, at this point, uh, largely because of advances in computation, the visualization is an enormous problem. So indeed is the actual uh, the, uh, the display of the data on the screen and the passing of the data between servers and clients and so on. Here's a picture of, um, uh, of our zoning system uh, in the sense you can see that the big towns uh, uh, in England and Wales have got uh, many more zones, the zoning system is finer, so in other words we have a matrix of flows behind every one of these uh, 
uh, every one of these polygons which is shown in that sense. Now we're working with this model on the desktop, we're also working with it on the web basically. One of the, one of the issues about building a model at this scale uh, is that we need it to be web-based because the, the idea is that um, uh, anybody in the UK who has an interest in any of these areas will be able to log on uh, and, uh, and, and run their scenarios, their what-if scenarios in this particular context. Again, I've not told you much about the model, but you can think of this as, say, a journey to work model or journey to shop, etc. It's a, a fairly uh, extensive urban model, eventually dealing with flows and locations. Um, and of course, the idea is that uh, this would be on the web. Now, there are all sorts of problems relating to big data uh, which pertain to this. One of the features is that we might have many users, uh, so we, we have this issue uh, of the model being uh, and the data being uh, on servers and uh, you accessing the, the model and the data using the client in this particular context from anywhere uh, within the UK, for anywhere in the world that ma for that matter, with, uh, as long as you have an internet line. Um, and this data, um, uh, this access I should say, uh, really leads to a number of users actually using the model at the same time. So we have all sorts of decisions to make. How much of the data and the computation goes on the server side? How much on the client side? Um, and what happens when large numbers of users log on? Do they get sort of uh, do they have to queue up to actually deal with the processing and so on? So these are the kind of issues involved in 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 in, in manipulating uh, data, which is big in some sense, and problems which are also big in that sense. So here's a picture of the server. Uh, you can read that the, the the model is on the server side and the maps are on the client side in this particular. Uh, version in this particular one. So you see the clients logging onto the server. Maps have to be passed from server to client, etc. And there's a there's a, a, a time involved in that. The model is on the server side and runs very quickly. Uh, but it's the delivery of the data across the web that, that that really is all important at that point. So here's a picture of Quant, basically, which is our model. I'm going to go through this very quickly. This is an it's an alpha version, not a beta version, really, at this point. Uh, and you can see that um, in visual visualizing the flows in the model, uh, we're using Ravenstein's time-honored technique of uh, 150 years or so ago. Uh, these are the vectors, the, these arrows in fact, which are shown on the right, are the, are the averages of the flows from any one of those 7,200 areas to any other. So we pick one, for example, uh, um, uh, an output area in London, and we look at the flows to everywhere else in uh, England and Wales in this case, and we produce a vector of it and we plot it that way. So we have a massive loss of information uh, in this context, but uh, a good loss of information in the sense that we're producing a vector field really in that sense. Okay, let me begin to finish it off and talk a little bit about uh, the, the really uh, interesting uh, and uh, uh, impressive big data that is being delivered at this point. Now this is stream data in a transport context. Uh, we have a project in London where uh, uh, Transport for London have delivered us uh, some tranches of the Oyster card data set. The Oyster card is the RFID card that about 80% of travellers in London use to access and to travel on the tube and the buses and uh, some network rail, some overground. Um, and we have about 12 million tap-in, tap-outs per day. Uh, this is a big data set. It, it becomes particularly big when you scale it up to something like six months' worth of data. We're talking about over a billion tap-in, tap-outs. Uh, and uh, in this particular context, it's a challenge to begin to visualize it in a sense. And we need lots of new techniques in that sense. Now, um, I've, I've gone through this very quickly that uh, there is a... Uh, there is some stuff online which gives you an indication of this, but what you can see here, just about, I guess, is the visualization of the flow data. Now, putting together the tap-in, tap-out data to produce flows between stations is, is no mean effort in this particular context, but it's not that different from what uh, Lieutenant Har Harness did uh, back in Dublin in 1837 for the British Army, that we're still plotting um, uh, data and simplifying it in this particular context and we have all the problems of, of visualization that I've been sketching so far. Okay, let me um, uh, wind it up really in this sense and, and, and really make the point that big data is not what it seems. We've always had big data uh, and this is not just because of computing limits, it's because we were never able to handle big data uh, in the past in that sense. So making sense of data is the all-important issue. 
Um, and uh, this involves a great deal of ingenuity with respect to visualization and a great deal of ingenuity, I think, with respect to how we begin to manipulate that data, particularly in, in a world where the web uh, and uh, uh, interactive computing across the web uh, is really now becoming the norm. Uh, and at this point, it's probably worth saying that some of the things that you read about in terms of big data, the idea that statistics begins to break down, that we need new techniques for data mining and so on, are really quite important uh, in this context, as well as new techniques for uh, visualization. Now, I'll stop at that point. Uh, here are my coordinates, um, some acknowledgments to uh, people who uh, help us in these projects. But uh, uh, have a look at my website, uh, Complex City. Uh, dot info and uh, uh, you will then be able to drill down and um, uh, probably find examples that I've shown you in this particular uh, uh, in this particular uh, slideshow thank you